Good morning. How is everyone? Good? It's good to see you all. Will you stand with us? Let's worship together. Good morning, church. My name is Cindy, and today I'd like to call us to worship. I would like to read from Psalms 103, verse 1 to 5. Let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. 
He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Let this psalm remind us of his love and all the things he has done for us. Even in the bad times, he wants us to come before him and lay it at his feet, to come as we are. Let our response be full of praise, praising him with fervor, with all that we are and a heart filled with gratitude. He is here, he wants all of our heart. He is worthy of it all. And if you need any form of prayer request, there are prayer teams at the back. Mm, let's worship. Amen. Amen. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that
Let's just pause and just consider, you know, as we sing, Jesus, we love you. It's all just response to his goodness to us. It's all response to his initiating love for us. So just as we've sung these words, just the hopeless have found their hope. The orphans have a home. All that was lost has found its place in you. You lift our weary head. You make us strong. You took these rags and you made them beautiful. You made us beautiful. Just, can we have a moment and just think of where God has just been kind, where he's just been good. Even if we're in the middle of something that feels really hard, maybe we just stop and consider how he is walking with us through it. God, you're faithful and you're so good.
We could ever know <laughs> you're so worthy all of this is response to you Lord to your goodness to your holiness to the way you walk with us and move in our midst we love you Lord yeah 
Lord, we just invite you uh, as we continue this morning, as we greet one another, as we open your word, as we fellowship afterwards, as we leave from this place, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, renew us today. Speak your word to us and your truth to our hearts. God, may it find good soil. Um, send us from here with your power and your love, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're so glad to have you. Welcome. Will you just take a minute um, before we sit down and find someone you might not know and what, make them feel welcome this morning? Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. Oh, I see a Seattle Kraken shirt. Come on, let's go Kraken. Come on, let's go. It's today, right? Tonight. Let's go. Sorry, no Yankees. Love you, Guillermina. No Yankees. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, welcome everybody. We are so glad to be gathered together. I'm Chris. I serve here as the lead pastor. And if I haven't met you, gosh, I would sure like to. And if you're here for a first time, thank you. You're giving us your time, which is the most valuable thing that you have. And in your time, you're extending us a trust. So thank you for that. And we hope to host you well, that you're experiencing the love of God. Jesus loves you immensely. And we hope that we communicate that in our warmth and kindness towards you. So welcome. We need our middle schoolers to go ahead and stand on up if there are any in, in here. I see numerous standing up right now. We've got Andrew back there and his leadership team is ready for you. You're going to study from scripture and we're going to do the same thing in here. But first, if you'll go ahead and pull out your phone, you're going to need it here as I walk you through a number of things quickly. Go to mc4s.org or open up our app as you may have that downloaded. And allow me just to walk you through these four things. The first thing you'll note on the website is that we have a digitized connect card. And it is intended to help us do the very thing it name, its name suggests, right? We can't connect deeply in a setting such as this where we're all gathered together and where there is something of a format. But we can connect outside of this place in deeper ways. And we want to do that, especially if you're newer here. I'd love the opportunity to reach your way and personalize a thank you. So if you fill that out, give us an email. You'll hear from me tomorrow or the next day as you're newer among us. But if you've been here for any length of time, you can give us updated information, opt into our next water baptism, begin to serve on a Sunday or in an outreach during the week. And as you scroll down, you'll find a place for a prayer request. And our promise remains this, that everything you entrust to us in prayer, we will indeed pray for this coming week. So thank you for allowing us to stand with you. On the note of prayer, it's important to us. We believe in its place and power in the local church. And so we want to be inviting you into the spaces where communal prayer is happening. And it's important to note that sometimes we hit some difficulties in our walk with Jesus. Sometimes we find prayer a little bit challenging on our own. And I would tell you that those are especially the moments to lean into places where communal prayer is happening. So you can go to that prayer link on our website and you can find the spaces where that's happening and be invited into those. Also, you'll find a digital giving link. And this is one of the means by which we continue our response to God. Worship is response to God. And so we give of our first fruits and thanksgiving for his rescuing of our lives in Jesus and his tender shepherding care of us. Thank you for your generosity, church family. Uh, many of you use this digital link. Many who join us online do the same. Thank you for joining us, by the way, and welcome. But as you're here and you might have a physical gift that you'd like to give, there are boxes by each of the doors that you could drop it in as you leave at the conclusion of our gathering. And then lastly, the events page is going to keep you in the know. Late spring, summer is coming, and we're overjoyed at that. I sure hope you've been enjoying the sun. Dear goodness, it's been glorious, and my soul needed it. Yeah, it's like a lid of depression just got lifted off of me, right? I was just running around outside just because I could, right? So... It's been wonderful, and we're grateful for the provision of it. But as the sun comes out, we go out in it, and we camp, and we have fun, and therefore we do a little bit less in this season. But please do keep paying attention to the events because things are happening. Two things to note. This coming Wednesday night, we have our healing prayer night. 
we maintain a belief that Jesus is a healer, body, soul, and spirit. And we want to invite you to receive prayer around such things, disease, sickness, uh, harassment of your soul, just places where you feel beat up and a bit stuck. And we want to pray with you for what God can do in the person and work of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Also wanted to let you know that we have a benefit concert coming up. We did this last spring, and we were so moved by the results, we wanted to do it again. We have artists in our congregation who are going to be offering original music, so you get to hear from them, which is exciting in and of itself. But we also get to receive from Atlas Free, which is an anti-human trafficking agency globally. They are doing work globally and in our own backyard locally regarding helping remove women and and, and girls out of human sex trafficking. And so we believe that this is a kingdom of heaven work on earth. And uh, it was last year that we raised several tens of thousands of dollars towards this together. And we'd like to see what we might be able to do again this year in this kingdom of heaven work. So please come, receive a wonderful night of, of music, original music, but also learn more about Atlas Free. And as you are able, consider how you might participate in this work through a gift. And with all that said, would you please take your Bible as you may have it or open up your Bible app to John chapter 14. John 14 will be in two spots today, John 14 and 1 Corinthians 15. As we continue, this is our third week of teaching in a spring series entitled Heaven. It'll last us five weeks overall. And today is specifically entitled Heaven as resurrection life. Heaven as resurrection life. So last week, Jennifer and I briefly traveled to Boston for a long anticipated time to be with pastors from all over the nation to care for one another and deepen our relationships. It happened that we had to return from Boston early. Our son's senior recognition baseball game was moved while in Boston, so we had to return home. We weren't gonna miss that, but it just so happened that on that unexpected trip home, Jennifer and I sat next to a man named John who's from Boston, and he proved to be among the most gregarious and winsome men I have encountered in a long time. We spoke most of the flight, which could be annoying, but I just need you to know that John did not prove to have a lack of social awareness or boundaries, but was just so genuine to interact with, 70-year-old man. And so he told me about his profession. And wouldn't you believe this? This guy was trained in marine cartography. Do you know what cartography is? The science and, and creation of maps. I sat next to a guy trained in cartography for five hours. I mean, you all know that I love maps and we make fun of it. But guys, a whole new world has opened up to me. Marine cartography. I'd never bothered to think of marine cartography. Maps of the oceans and seas and lakes. He was trained in the science of nautical maps for marine navigation. So utilizing his specialty, he eventually landed in boat design and construction, and he, he just loves it. He's 70, so I was asking him, like, so what's, what's the next number of years got? And he's like, more of this. I have no plans to slow down. I love it. I'm living my best life. I was like, John, you're amazing. Showed me pictures of two years earlier at 68, climbing an alpine mountain covered with snow, ice pick out as he hangs from the side. I'm like... Who are you, John? <laughs> but in the process of these conversations and these episodes of conversations, at one point he told me that 10 years earlier, his wife had passed away. And so as our time continued, I eventually was able to ask him, John, how do you handle your grief? How do you deal with your loss? And he replied, well, um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a religious nut or anything, but I had an experience that convinces me she's in a better place. Thought, oh, interesting. Tell me about it. And he went on to detail for me how prior to his wife's passing, a number of years prior to, he had had a massive heart attack and had died. 
died on the table. And he had an experience that many would describe as out of body, that he could actually look down upon his body on the table. And then he remembers going somewhere else. He was no longer in the room, no longer looking at himself. He was somewhere else. And in that somewhere else, he was met by his mother, who was a very warm and loving presence in his life. Like he could not speak more highly of his mother. And she spoke words of comfort and welcome to him. And then all of a sudden, he was back in his body. And he is most definitely alive today at 70 years old. <laughs> He's my new hero. I want to look and act like John at 70. I've got a long ways to go. I think at 70, he's healthier than I am at 46. So I have some goals to now reach for. But John essentially answered my question by saying this. The way I deal with my grief is hope. I have hope. He says he misses his wife every day. He showed us her photo and, and he spoke of her with tremendous fondness but he's able to continue to live and live vibrantly in the wake of his loss because he has hope. After he was done, I chuckled and I said, you know, <laughs> you're, you're talking to what most would probably consider two religious nuts. <laughs> I said, we, we pastor a local church. And he's like, no kidding, <laughs> really? Usually when I admit that, it shuts the conversation down, especially when you're flying back to Seattle. Yeah but it didn't. And he went on to inquire about me and my story. He said, how did you enter into the priesthood is how he initially said it. And I just, oh, John, thank you for asking. I said, you want to know the truth. John, before I answer that question about me, I've got to go backward. I said, I, I, I owe my parents a great deal. I stand on my parents' shoulders. My parents were genuine followers of Jesus who loved him and made responding to him so believable. I said, so that when I experienced Jesus in my early teens, like he just had me. But I wanted to describe what I have often told you about in terms of my own testimony, that I wasn't even really asking for it, but I encountered the love of God in an overwhelming sense. And that's what I described him. I said, John, what got me was Jesus and his love on the cross for me, that he would give himself for it. it got me. And when he got me, he got me. So when I discerned something of a call a number of years later to like serve him with my life, it was like, really? I could do that? I could love Jesus professionally and actually help others love Jesus with me? Yeah, I'm in. It was that simple for me. And it remains that simple for me. And you know what he said to me? <laughs> this is what he said in response to that. He goes, wow, your congregation is fortunate to have you. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. But that sounds very braggadocious. I tell you that to tell you what I immediately said back to him. I said, oh, John, we are fortunate to have them. We belong with them. We are so fortunate to have them. Heaven. Heaven, it's the outcome of our hope. Our hope is a person. And that person's presence equals heaven. The book of Hebrews tells us that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not yet see. So faith is a construct built upon conviction based in hope around what we don't fully have yet, but will. And it's, it's this hope that we want to study more about today. In this series, we're walking through our scriptures and investigating what's being said at critical points in the narrative. So we've studied Genesis and we studied Isaiah. We've gone back to the beginning, paradise. And then we've looked at a forerunner of the Hebrew prophets who proclaimed in the name of Yahweh promises about new creation. Today we're going to be in the Gospels and in the New Testament letters, which is a huge task. In fact, as I sat down to start studying on Monday, I thought, what fool built this series? And I said, me. <laughs> like, well, I did I think the Gospels and the letters was a, a good idea. But I still do. I'm actually really excited to teach this. We're going to fly over them at 10,000 feet, but we're going to get a good idea from them. Next week will be Revelation. And the final week, we're going to study not the opposite of heaven, as we often think of hell, but what really is a distortion of God's purposes. 
It was in Genesis that we learned about God's desire to bring heaven to earth. And that from its earliest mentions, heaven is always about divine presence. And it was last week that Mark took us to Isaiah where we, we heard about the promises of God towards new creation. And in this new creation, there would be the fullness of joy, justice, and shalom, or this fullness of life, well-being, and peace. And now as we turn our attention to the Gospels and the New Testament, we'll have to move quickly. There's a lot of Bible today. This is really a Bible study if you want to know the truth. And so we'll land in the Gospels first. We're going to look at John 14, and then we'll move to the letters in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, a little context around this in the Gospels. The first three Gospels are often called synoptic Gospels, or synonymous Gospels, if you will, because of their tremendous similarity to one another. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, most scholars would tell us that they had some original source that they used as a template for their storytelling. They're that similar. But John, John writes about 25 to 30 years post the other gospel writers. And he's writing to a whole other generation, a generation that had never seen or heard with their own eyes and ears the person and words of Jesus. And he's writing now to an increasingly Gentile audience. And so their coming to God was through a different lens. So it ought not to surprise us that the way in which the priority of the kingdom of heaven is declared in the synoptic gospel sounds a little bit different in the gospel of John. When we read the synoptics, B focuses on the declaration and the demonstration of the kingdom of God now on earth, the kingdom of heaven. And those two are used interchangeably, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus was about. He proclaimed healing, a a proclamation and a demonstration of, of heaven on earth. He proclaimed forgiveness, a proclamation, a demonstration of the kingdom of heaven on earth. So this is what the synoptics put forward. How does John capture this priority? Because it's there. It just sounds a little different. In my reading of John, I only found two direct references to the kingdom of God or heaven in John. The first one is in what many would consider the most famous conversation recorded in the Bible. Jesus with Nicodemus at night. And in John 3, 3, Jesus says to him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And then later in the gospel, Jesus, as Pilate is considering the application of capital punishment against Jesus, Jesus says to Pilate, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But now my kingdom is from another place. What's that place? Heaven. Let's stop and notice something, though, pretty wonderfully radical here. Notice that Jesus suggests that nonviolence is the response of his kingdom because it's not of this world. Violence is a part of the kingdoms of this world but not a part of the kingdom of heaven. If my kingdom were of this world, well, they'd fight, but it's not, and so they're not. So if the proclamation of the kingdom of God or heaven was the substance of Jesus' teaching and demonstration, how exactly does this sound in the Gospel of John? Well, let's look at a few of these instances. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? John 6, 47. Very truly I tell you the one who believes has what? John eleven twenty five 25 and 26 as Jesus talks with Martha in light of her brother Lazarus dying. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The question of the ages. So for John, his focus was on connecting the person of Jesus to the relational dynamics and consequences, the experience that we have by belief in and a trust of him, of Jesus. John's saying we will get heaven 
which he's using this construct, a fullness of life, both in quantity and in quality. See, when we Westerners hear eternal life, we first think quantity, volume, forever. But when a Jew heard this construct in the first century, they flipped, their, their construct was flipped. They thought of quantity, excuse me, quality over quantity. To them, fullness of life was the fullness of joy, shalom, justice, like God's kingdom was here. And everything wrong about who we are and how we handle life will be addressed. A fullness of life, eternal life, kingdom life, kingdom of heaven, of li- kingdom of heaven life on earth. Okay, let's get to John 14 where Jesus uses a different analogy. In John 14, Jesus is in the midst of sharing the Passover meal with his disciples for a final time prior to his death and subsequent resurrection. This, of course, is the evening, as we remember just a few weeks ago during Passion Week, that uh, Judas leaves to betray Jesus to the authorities. Immediately prior to what we're about to read in John 14, there's really what we need to read is a heart-wrenching conversation between Jesus and Peter. And again, we see part of the beauty of Peter's character here. Peter is deeply loyal. And I cannot wait to meet Peter. Guys, I cannot wait to meet Peter. I am so grateful for him. (laughs) He's really loyal. But he's wounded in this conversation. He's confused. But he speaks of his loyalty. And Jesus, unfortunately, has to remind him of what's about to be. So let me quickly recount that because it has bearing for what we're going to read. So Jesus tells the disciples that they cannot go where he's, he's going. And so Peter asks, well, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus tells him that he cannot come now, but he will later. And Peter responds with this, this expression of loyalty. And he just, he asks, why? Why can't I follow you now? Why can't I go where you are going now? He says, I'll I'll die for you if I have to. I'll go wherever you're going, even if I have to die. And that's when, of course, Jesus tells Peter, he says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And when you hear the rooster for the second time, the dawning realization of what you've done will hit you. Of course, that's exactly what transpires, right? That in that moment, Peter chose self-preservation, which, by the way, Many of us do every day. That is a very strong impulse for the broken human condition. On the heels of that conversation, we now pick up in John 14. We're going to initially read verses 1 through 4, where Jesus says this to all the disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So this is a scene fraught with anxiety. All this conversation about death, denial, suffering, I mean, it's shaken the disciples to their core. Jesus has been systematically teaching them that this is coming. He, re- he has told them that he's going to be treated like John the Baptist, who was killed. He's told them in no uncertain terms that he will die, but that he will also rise from the grave three days later. He's told them these things, but their ability to grasp it, given that it doesn't fit their messianic hope, it had not settled. It, at, this was the moment where it was fully set, settling. Jesus was sober. And they were feeling it. And there was anxiety. Now this statement of Jesus, don't let your hearts be troubled, can be one of two things. Either the most tone-deaf statement of our Savior, or actually just a very teachable moment. And we see numerous moments in the Gospels when Jesus chooses to teach something even though the disciples can't grasp it yet. Because as he would say to them later, 
the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth and what I have taught you will come home to roost, if you will, in your heart. Your heart will be able to grab onto it. And indeed, that happens in short order here, but they're not there yet. They are troubled. And Jesus seeks to refocus their understanding on what he's doing in going away. He tells them he's going to the Father's house. And this, if, if we know anything about heaven, it, there's probably something attached to this, right? I mean, if you're a child of the 80s and early 90s like I was, and you listened to Audio Adrenaline, or called Audio A, right? Big, big house with lots and lots of room. Yeah. Can I just tell you, it's terrible theology, but it's a fun song, right? Because we talk about, I'm going to have a mansion in heaven and streets paved with gold. And I understand why you say that, because you read John 14, mansion, and you read Revelation, and your streets paved with gold. I want you to think less that way as a 21st century Westerner and more as a first century Jew receiving this teaching. They would not have that thought at all. So most scholars would tell us that in him talking about going to his father's house, they would have heard two immediate things, potentially. An allusion to a construct of heaven. Remember what we said in the first week, right? The cosmology of ancient Israel, they placed God at their highest level of understanding beyond what they could see. So the highest heaven, if you will. So that father's house, which also coincided, remember the Jews thought that heaven on earth was what? The temple. The temple was the place where heaven and earth met. So they would have been confused. Are you going there? Are you going to the temple? Where are you going? We don't know where you're going. But also, I want you to hear something else they may have, which is betrothal language. When a young man and a young woman were pledged to each other through their families, a betrothal was commenced. And betrothal was as binding as we consider marriage today exclusive but the wedding had not happened and the marriage was not yet consummated so the betrothal period was a time for the young man often but not always somewhere in the realm of 16 to 18 betrothed to somewhere around 13 year old woman he now goes about proving that he is ready to care for and support a wife that will lead to a family god willing so one of the things he's doing is proving faithful in his trade, and he adds a room on his family's house, on his father's house. So as these disciples are shaken to their core, he's using a picture that is so comforting. And guys, here's what I'm trying to tell you. You're going to be with me. I will be with you. You will be with me. I'm going to my father's house. And I'm preparing a space for you. This is the betrothal language of the ancient Israel process. The young man's preparing a place to receive his bride. <laughs> I'm creating a space for you. So it's far less mansion. And it's much more we're together. That's what they would be hearing. I intend to take you with me. And rest assured, you know the way. Well, let's listen to their response. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him in this radical statement, and you have seen him. To see God, to see the face of God, <laughs> was to have a response like Isaiah in the sixth chapter. Woe is me, I have seen God, and I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among an unclean people, like I'm a dead man. But Jesus said, you've seen, you have seen the face of God. You've, if you've seen mine, if you've beheld my visage, you have seen the Father. Oh, heaven has come to earth. But Thomas disagrees, right? Thomas is like, Jesus, we have no idea where you're talking about. So how in the world can we know the way to where we don't know about? We are confused. And Jesus offers 
the Father's presence as the destination and himself as the means of arrival. Let's stop and just recognize that this is actually what Jesus consistently does to to and for his disciples in the scriptures, but also to us as we are his disciples. Very rarely does Jesus promise a specific outcome in a difficulty of life. But what does Jesus always promise in the difficulties, challenges, and happenings of life? Himself. Himself. I want to be with you in what you're facing, and I will. You can count on it. I will walk with you into the fires. You'll find me there. I'm the way, he said. Do you remember what Jesus said to Nathaniel all the way in John chapter one? We studied this two weeks ago. Do you remember what he said? I'm Jacob's staircase, me. I'm Jacob's staircase. Where I am, so is heaven. So much so that I tell you this, that as you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You get all of God. You get all of him. So the gospels. The kingdom of heaven's arrival is with Jesus. And the promise of God's personal presence uh, to his disciples through Jesus. Now, as the the New Testament continues to unfold, so too do, do statements about heaven. And in particular, a few throw ins of what happens when we die. And that's really what they are. Uh, The the scriptures are not focused on answering that question, but boy, is it one we're asking. And I get why we ask it, because we love and we lose. We want to know. Where does my loved one go when he or she dies? Where do I go? What's the point of this all? And so let's, let's quickly look at some of the New Testament letters, and then we'll get to 1 Corinthians 15. Now, in Philippians, which is Paul's happiest letter and my favorite New Testament letter, it was the first... New Testament letter I started to memorize. And I love it. It's in here. It got in here really early in my walk with Jesus. I love Paul's happiest letter. He's writing the most enduring thank you note in human history. He is so thankful for these Philippians. He knows them by name. He knows them. He knows what their faces look like. And they've been partners with him in the gospel. He's sitting in a jail cell, which by the way, he had to fund. And so they sent him a gift of resource, and he's overwhelmed. He says, thank you, thank you. I love you. Every time I think of you, I do so with joy. You make me so happy. This is what he's talking about, right? But as he talks about his happiness over the Philippians, he also unveils his life philosophy, the way he sees the world, the point of living to him. And it's some of the most compelling writing in all of Scripture. For me, he says, to live is what? Christ. And to die is gain. So to Paul, as he's sitting in a jail cell, he says this, I'm pretty confident I'm going to be released, that this imprisonment will not end in death. And why am I convinced of that? Because I think God intends more fruit bearing for the kingdom of heaven on this broken planet before I go to join him wherever he is. But he also says this, he goes, honestly, guys, when I just think of myself, I'd prefer to go. That's better for me. I want to go be with Jesus. But when I think of you, I want to stay and I want to continue to bear fruit with Jesus. This is what he's talking about in Philippians. To Paul, heaven was Jesus. His theology of heaven, Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, he echoes the statement by saying that he'd prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Which in just by saying this simple statement answers a huge question that we have. What happens when we die as those who acknowledge Jesus? What happens? Where do we go? Well, we go to be with the Lord. We go to the immediate presence of God. And therefore, we go to heaven. Because where he is, so is heaven. But it's a temporal heaven, as I hope you're catching on to. Much more on that next week and a little bit in the words that are to come. Let's listen into Paul now as he's writing to Thessalonian believers. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He writes, Brothers and sisters, 
We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the Thessalonians are writing to Paul or sending messengers to Paul and they're angsty. Our friends are dying. My husband died. My wife died. Where is he? Where is she? And so Paul writes to inform the Thessalonians, thinking around this hope of resurrection, assuring them that those who have trusted in Jesus but have died will be resurrected as he returns to bring the fullness of his reign to earth, heaven and earth being remarried. And those of us who are alive at the time of his return will welcome him like a king returning to his capital city. This is the language of being caught up in the air. A lot of us view this as theology that suggests a rapture. And when we talk about a rapture, we're talking about a construct at the end whereby at one point those who believe in Jesus are pulled out of the world. I do not believe this Thessalonian text is actually teaching that. But what Paul is using is imagery that these Romans would have understood. When a king returns to his city, they often sent envoys ahead of him, and he said, the king is coming, the king is coming, and so what would the citizens do? They would exit the city and create a processional to welcome the king back to his capital city. And that's what Paul's talking about. When he returns, first thing you need to know is your loved one that trusted Jesus, they'll be coming with him. They'll be coming in his undiminished glory and they will be a little bit different than they were when you knew them. And when they come, we will be united, all of us together, right? We will go out. We will go up. He's coming back the way he left is what we're told. He will come back. We will be caught up with him. But what are we doing? We're not exiting the scene. We are returning as Jesus brings the fullness of his reign to planet Earth, kingdom of heaven on earth in full, boom. His radiant glory will literally transform everything. We're gonna look at something here shortly about that, but first we need to get to 1 Corinthians 15. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul expounds on heaven as resurrection life and what that means for our embodied existence. Christian theology would tell you this, to be human is to have a body. <laughs> so as we have a temporary state where we are disembodied, our, our long-term humanity requires a body. We are made in the image of God and we were made with a body. And Paul doubles down on that theological premise here in 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about our embodied existence in the fullness of the reign of God. So let's, let's go, 1 Corinthians 15. We're gonna initially read 35 through 38. Paul says this, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body will they come? Well, how foolish. What you sow does not come to life until it dies, unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of weed or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. So Paul's working really hard in 1 Corinthians to, to substantiate that the dead will be resurrected just as Jesus was. And here he works explaining how they will be raised. That how is one of transformation, and he initially alludes to nature as a means of understanding this. He talks about a seed being sown, a small little seed dropping into the ground, dying, and the resulting plant. And what he's talking about is this, that you don't, you don't put into the ground the plant. 
It doesn't replicate itself exactly as it was planted. You put something small into the ground, something that's hopeful, and God causes it to have a body. It grows, and it looks quite different than you deposited into the earth. In other words, what you put into the ground is far outweighed by what comes out of it. This is what he's going for. What it starts out as is far outweighed by what it becomes. And then Paul continues in verse 39. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh. Animals have another. Birds have another. Fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies another. The sun has one kind of splendor. The moon another. The stars another. The stars differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. And do you notice, even in that language, heaven and earth marrying itself? We think of spiritual as non-substantive. But here, a spiritual body. But a body, tangible. This is awesome. A spiritual body. What does that mean? We're going to fly like Superman? Maybe. I leave that as a very real possibility. Paul states that within creation, there are heavenly bodies and earthly ones. I don't want you to be confused since we're talking about heaven. When he's referencing heavenly bodies, he's talking about celestial bodies. So another way to uh, read some of his language here would be like celestial and terrestrial. In other words, celestial, sun, moon, and stars, terrestrial, humans, animals, and the like, right? Things on earth, things in the cosmos. Heavenly bodies, earthly ones. Paul applies this analogy to explain that human bodies as we exist at present are mortal, dishonorable, weak, and natural. I think that all makes sense to us, but maybe we would need to work a little bit at understanding his reference to dishonorable. Remember that Paul's writing into an honor-shame culture. So what he's saying is that this, this body is prone to inevitably lead to that which would bring public shame and discredit. So, mortal, dishonorable, weak, and natural, but these resurrection bodies that God's promising will be immortal, glorious, that we will reflect our creator as the moon reflects the sun's radiance. Glorious, marked by God's power and spiritual or supernatural. Our bodies will be supernatural. In short, God will create new bodies for those resurrected and no shame can attach itself where God's full glory now dwells. No shame will beset you in your resurrected body. Having observed these these texts, I want to make two application points or thoughts for us that have meaning for the way we live now. Heaven is resurrection life. Number one, God's greatest victory for us is deliverance from death. God's greatest victory for us is deliverance from death. Death in every form and fashion of it is horrible, terrible, destructive, utterly destructive. It is an inevitability for the created order in its present form given the virus of sin. But as God longs to bring heaven to earth to remarry the two, he began to accomplish all of this through Jesus who is called the first fruits of new creation. So we get this idea that Jesus in bodily form, in resurrected form, is literally the first new body on a broken planet. He's walking through walls. He's appearing and disappearing. It's like, what? But he's like, guys, where's some fish? I'm hungry. And he eats it. New creation, first fruits of new creation. Let's listen in a little bit earlier in Paul's thinking as it's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. He writes, 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. This was a, an agrarian a, a word. Uh, first fruits was the first of your flock, the first of your harvest. You offer the first as a sign of the whole. And God said, if you will give me your first, I will breathe on and bless the whole. Right? So this is the language. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So the intention of God is to bring life and to bring it, as the Gospel of John would put it, in its fullness or in its abundance. There is one who seeks to steal or to destroy, but in response, God wants to bring restoration, healing, wholeness, shalom to his creation, life in fullness or in wholeness. And let us remember that while we wait for this fullness, we are actively participating in heavenly life right now. So the question is how? How are we participating in heavenly life right now? What's the answer of Jesus? Or shall we say, who is the answer of Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Well, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way that by the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are now tasting of the age that is to come. By the Holy Spirit, we are tasting heavenly life right now. We are experiencing a, a little bit of the lot that is coming. Because of this, the New Testament writers have this construct that how we live right now is to reflect how we will live then, what will be ours then. They have this idea that like life right now bears a level of consequence for life then. We're going to look at that here momentarily. Let's listen to Paul one more time, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 58. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. I want you to see a picture as he even says that. I have no idea if Paul was intending this. But sting, like a snake bite. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, which is to say the law defines sin. The law defines righteousness and unrighteousness, sin. And so sin finds its power through that definition. It is constantly pulling us through the virus that is now in us, sin, to move in ways that are unrighteous rather than God ways righteous. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your life's going somewhere. So live like it counts. Heaven is resurrection life. God's greatest victory for us is deliverance from death. And number two, heaven is resurrection life. You're going to hear this application point probably every week of this series. Heaven and earth being reunited is the ultimate goal. This is where everything's going and where you will be in it. One of our tasks in this series is to helpfully reorient our thinking around heaven in keeping with the scriptural priorities attached to it. That is to say, as important as the question is, hey, where do I go when I die is, and it's important. What the Bible is emphasizing around heaven is not really a direct answer to that question. It's thrown in there. That's helpful. <laughs> but it's not actually the focal point. 
There's something bigger that God is doing that will include all who run to his son for shelter and rescue. I want to put in front of you now the words of Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. I think it's important to recognize that Peter knew his end was near. And as such, he's writing. And he says, I'm going to repeat some important things to you, and I don't mind repeating them at all because they're important. I think it's also worth noting that church history, some of the earliest church fathers, several of them recorded Peter's death. And their record is profound. So Peter was crucified, but one church father says that in that in considering himself unworthy to be crucified as his as his Lord and friend, he requested to be crucified upside down. Another church father tells us that Peter was made to watch his wife crucified before him. And that that writer tells us a very simple refrain that Peter spoke to her as she was walking to her cross. And he just said, remember the Lord. Yelled it out, remember our Lord. As, As Peter's end is near, among the things he writes, we read this. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. But they will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Here Peter is detailing the return of Jesus. And Peter has grasped onto this, that in all likelihood he will die before the return of Jesus. And he reminds us what Jesus taught him. Boy, whenever that happens, it's going to happen fast, like a thief in the night. It'll be sudden, quick. But he describes when Jesus returns that the physical universe as it exists at present will be consumed in the radiant glory of God coming with Jesus and utter transformation will occur. This radiant glory of God, do you know what it's called, what the Hebrew word is for it? Shekinah, Shekinah, Shekinah. The undiminished, unfiltered, full radiance glory of God. So when we read about fire here, we could be like, fire. God must be angry. This is not an angry fire. This is glory. This is kingdom of heaven coming in full on earth and earth in its present form. The cosmos in its present broken form cannot exist as it has. It must be reborn. It will be consumed in radiant glory and reborn and remade. New heavens, new cosmos, new earth, new bodies. (laughs) That's heaven. That's what the Bible says is heaven. So, you know, often we think, gosh, what are we, am I just going to sing to God in heaven on a cloud? Probably not. You're going to be on earth. You'll probably have jobs, and guess what? Everything you do will work, and you will like it. You'll steward things with God. The curse will be removed. You'll be more creative than you could have ever imagined. You want to paint the Mona Lisa? Go for it. You can. All right. Now I'm just riffing. I'm having fun. The point is renewal. 
everything being reborn, new creation. And I think we could all just say, oh gosh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait for the curse of sin to be lifted off my life. I cannot wait for the curse of sin to be lifted off this world. We sigh and moan. You know, Paul writes, you know, that this life that we know, this paradox that we live in, he says, outwardly, we're wasting away. Man, this body fails. It's broken. I get tired. I can't seem to find the energy level I once had. This body is wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Yeah, resurrection life. Maybe we'll just end on this, Peter's thought, the looming question. If this is all so, what sort of people ought we to be now? So Father, with that in heart and mind, we now pray and ask that by the power of your Spirit, come Holy Spirit, by the power of your spirit, that you would continue this work that you've promised to do. We are thankful that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves to you, body, soul, spirit, every fiber of our being. And we say, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, bring healing and shalom to our lives. All the more, Lord, use us to be conduits of healing and shalom in the world. Oh, God, we love you. God, we love you. Thank you for your great and precious promises. Peter has told us that we have everything we need for life and godliness. So would you add whatever is according to your pleasure to each of our lives? We are yours, God. You have won us in Jesus. Help us, Spirit. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. And would you say with me, amen.